In the early hours of June 24, 2020, which also happened to be the fourth birthday of one of our grandchildren, uh, Amali, my beautiful and faithful wife, Florina April Ramsden, uh, passed into eternity to be with her Lord, who she loved more than anything. If you've ever lost somebody who's really precious to you, whether it be a, a grandfather, a mother, a sister, a child, or maybe even a close friend, you know very, very well the pain and the grief and the tears that follow. But something else follows too, the next generation. Florina and I have seven grandchildren, the oldest being seven, and the youngest will see the light of day around uh, late January, early February next year. At the moment, the little grandchildren, they remember Florina well. They know what she looks like. Uh, they remember what she sounds like. Uh, but as time goes on, those memories are definitely going to fade. And that's the purpose for this project. It's for our grandchildren so that they can see their grandmother and learn about how much uh, their grandmother loved the Lord and also anybody who she came into contact with. And so, my precious grandchildren, this is the story of Nini and Nodji and their life together. Are you ready? By the way, if you're somebody who loved Florina or knew her, you're welcome to come for the ride too. So how does Florina, a cute little fourth grade blonde haired girl from Keong Park Primary School in the northern suburbs, finish up with John, a little fourth grade boy from Heathmont Primary School in the eastern suburbs who in the picture is proudly messing up his second annual class photo in a row? Well... 15,108 days ago in this very spot here at Belgrave Heights Convention on April the 13th, 1979. It was Good Friday actually and the night meeting had just finished and I was at the back of the hall up there and I looked down and I saw a guy that I did year 11 with the second time and uh, Peter was there. I thought what a good opportunity to go and speak to Peter. Okay so it's a bit of a lie. Let me tell you the true story. The date's right. It is Friday the 13th and it is April and it is Good Friday and I, I am here at Belgrave Heights Convention but the reality is it wasn't Peter that I was interested in because there was a really cute looking chick standing next to him wearing pink overalls and had blonde hair and she was gorgeous. And so I thought what a good opportunity to use Peter to actually meet whoever this girl was. And so I went down and Peter introduced me to her and the three of us were talking and suddenly it was just the two of us talking and then there was hardly anybody left in the hall after about the next half hour they were wanting to close up and so I said see you later and she said see you later and I said bye and she said bye and I started to turn and just like in the movies we did that thing where you look back and you don't want to be seen to be looking back but that's actually how it worked and it must have taken me five minutes to even get out of the building and away she went. So the next day is Saturday and I've just got my first job as a teacher and so I had to go out to Yarra Valley and spend all day there getting organised with the curriculum, with my room, all the things that I didn't know because I'd never taught before. What I didn't know at the same time, Florina had come to the morning meeting to find me, I wasn't here. Came to the afternoon meeting, I wasn't here. And she was going to go home but she thought, I'll just come to the, uh, to the last meeting at night and if he's not there then I'll give up and I'll go. Me, all day, I've just got this girl with pink overalls in my brain and so I'm quick as I can and I scream back up to Belgrave Heights and just in time for the uh, night meeting and so I'm leaning against the wall out the front here and my eyes are scanning everywhere trying to look like I'm not looking for anybody in particular and Florina comes past and she goes hi and I go oh hi and then she walks in and then I go well, what do I do now? Um, so I walk into the building and then I spot her in about the third front row, shoving people out of the way and making sure that there's a seat there. And I thought, this could be good. So I walked down, I said, hey, is it all right if I sit here? And she goes, yeah, sure, yeah, come and, come and sit here. So I sat down with her, the meeting together. And at the end of the night, rather than speak to her here, I walked her back to the place where she was at, which was about a kilometre and a half away from here with a, a camp. And uh, on the way we talked and we got to know a little bit more about each other. And then I thought, I know that there's a dawn service at Mount Dandenong and I said to her, hey, would you like to come to the dawn service with me tomorrow morning uh, up at Mount Dandenong? She goes, yeah, great. And so at this point, she says to me, why don't you take my car keys of my brand new Gemini SLE, drive back to the camp and then pick me up in the morning and take me up there. I said, great. So as I'm driving off, I'm going, I'm driving this girl, I can't even remember her first name properly. And she's given me her car. Oh. Apparently she's sitting there as I drive off going, 
what have I done? I've just given my car to a guy I don't even know his second name. I can just see the police saying, well, it was stolen, was it? Well, no, I gave it away. So she's hoping that I'm going to come back. Of course I did. That morning I picked her up. We went to that service. And it was wonderful. That morning, though, I had to go and play the piano at our church. And so I went to our church and when I would finished playing the piano, I actually got up and went to one of the vases at the front of the church and took one of the flowers out to bring it back for her. Now, when I got back here, it was lunchtime and Florina, I knew, was down at this campsite. So I ran all the way down there. And when I got there, they were about to serve lunch. And so I went into the kitchen and they said, oh, who are you? I said, I've just come to help uh, give out the lunches today. Oh, OK, thanks. So I put a tea towel around my arm, got a meal and I took it down uh, to her and presented it to her. Big smile on her face. I'm thinking this is going pretty well. So Sunday comes and at the end of Sunday, I go home and Florina, uh, she heads off too. And before we leave, say bye, bye, see ya, see ya. Didn't have a number. Uh, all I knew was that she was a teacher from Yarpeet and her second name was Lake. I could not remember her first name. And so when I got home, I thought I've got to do something about this. So I looked in the phone book and I started ringing up every lake in the phone book. I started at A and worked my way through until I found her. And her father's name's Ernie, so I didn't have to go as far as I would have had to if his name had been Zacchaeus or something like that. And so I rang her and I found out where she was over in Reservoir and I went round to the house and I asked her if I could take her out. And she said, yeah, that'd be great. And as we're walking out the door, her mother says, we've actually got her 22nd birthday surprise party here in this house at 7.30 tonight. Can you have her back by 7.30? I'm going, man, that gives me about two hours. So I took her into town and we just walked around for a while. It was a weird sort of a night. A, a drunk guy got hit by a car and I ran out in the road and pulled him off. It was just weird stuff going on. But I thought I am going to get her home, okay? Because I don't want to get in the bad books with the family. So we head back to the car and I thought I'll drive and I haven't got the keys. I said, no, can I have the keys? And she said, I haven't got the keys. And we look in the car and there's the keys in the car. And so we spend the next hour and a half trying to get the keys out. And in the end, we finished up finding these two guys who had two cricket stumps and we went into a hospital and got a coat hanger, wound them together and got through the thing and opened it. And we arrived back at her house at 9.30, two hours late for the surprise party. And as we come in the door, Florina picks up her cat because it had just walked through the fly wire and dislocated its shoulder. So she walks in and goes, my cat and three people that are still in the house go surprise so it was not a good start to trying to impress her family I am Carolyn Alison Bethwin and I'm Glenda our mum was a poet she wrote an acrostic poem for almost everyone in the family we went searching for Florinas did we find it no but would you believe we found this written by her own mum who passed away in 2007. Florina April Lake was born on Easter Monday 22nd of April 1957 at 10.45 p.m. She was the fourth daughter for Dorothy and Ernest Lake. She weighed seven pound 14 ounces, had dark hair and blue eyes just the same as her sisters. She lost her dark hair and the new hair was very fair very fine and very slow growing, which was a bit of a worry at the time. She was adored and mothered by her older sisters and was really no problem. She started school in February 1962, age four, at Keon Park Primary School. She also started Sunday school at Regent Baptist and calisthenics along with her sisters. When six, she started in cadets at Girls Brigade and continued through the ranks until 18 when she achieved the Queen's Award badge. She was a very good netball player and in her early teens received the best and fairest trophy in the district's competition. She was always in the top group at school, always had friends. She was very sensitive and concerned for other people's problems. She learned to play the piano, went to Marylands High School, then McRobertson's Girls School, she passed sixth form and gained place at Coburg Teachers College. When she received her first teaching post, it was to Yarpeet, a one-teacher school in the Mildura district. It seemed like the end of the earth when she found a pin spot on the map.
Okay, so I didn't really get off to a great start with the Lake family to earn their love or their trust or their favour because of the fact that I got their daughter home two hours late for her surprise 22nd birthday party. Not to mention the fact that, if you remember, I took Florina out, but I was only able to be with her for about an hour. And when I said to her, I think it's time for me to take you home, she thought I didn't like her. I actually did. I just had to get her back to the house. The whole thing could have been a complete mess. It actually could have been over that night, except for one very important little factor. I was falling in love with her. Okay, so where did it all go from there? Well, the reality was after Belgrave Heights was over, Florina got really, really sick. And that's why she was still in Reservoir. But now she was feeling much, much better and it was time to get into her brand new Gemini SLE and head 420 k's into the northwest corner of Victoria to resume her teaching position in a little town that was pronounced, well, it was spelt Y-A-A-P-E-E-T. Now apparently when she first got her letter from the education department, and that was before I was around, she opened it up in front of a bunch of people and burst into tears. And they said, are you okay? Where is it? Where is it? And she goes, I can't even pronounce it. But this beautiful little town called Yarpeet was to become her home for this next year in 1979 as she began her teaching career. A new name, it was a new area and it was a new experience and coming here was all new, including mice plagues, dust storms. So for those of you who know Florina well, you're not going to be surprised at all to hear that the kids embraced her, the parents embraced her, the whole school community embraced her. In fact, I think every guy who was over 20 would have liked to have embraced her. Kids of guys rocking up that I didn't know, but they sure wanted to know me. No, I don't know what happened there. They made her the centre of the netball team. Uh, they would clear the snakes from underneath her steps so she could get into the classroom. That actually happened. And when they found out that she liked Mars bars, they would bring boxes of Mars bars from the general store down to her. And two guys from the footy team, Duck and Ferret, they would actually bring in a bucket milkshake with straws in it as well. And that's not to mention the parents who would cook and cook and cook like pantry loads of food, cakes and slices and all that sort of stuff until she could eat no more. I did go home something like 14 kilos heavier than when I arrived and that was because I was so embraced by the school community, taken home for tea, that was because I couldn't cook or do any of those things. I was just very young. She was everybody's friend. Everybody loved her. Trouble is, I loved her too. But the trouble also was that I'm now six hours away by car, particularly in my car. I was driving this old Wolseley 2480. The brakes hardly worked at all and the windscreen wipers, well, they occasionally worked. So how do we deal with being apart for such a long time? Keeping in mind that there's no FaceTime, there's no email, there's no messages, there's no Skype, there's not a bullet train that goes to Yarpeet, there's not a landing strip that you can just fly in there. Instead, we wrote letters. I wrote letters, but she was prolific. She wrote letters every single day. And if I didn't get a letter in two days, I'd go down to the police station and fill in a missing persons report. But what I loved about the letters were they were good fun. There's a lot of gooey stuff in there as well, which I'm not gonna go into. But what I did love is there was always some encouragement there. There's something out of scripture. There was something that God had been teaching her to, and I just loved to get those letters. We could communicate by phone, but it was a little bit different when you rang Yar Pete because there was an exchange. And so I'd ring the exchange and Mrs. Dillon would pick up the phone and say, can I connect you? And I'd say, Yar Pete 7, please, which was the school residence. And she'd plug me in. We'd talk for a little bit and she'd come back, Mrs. Dillon, she'd say, three minutes, are you extending? And so we would extend and depending on how much money I'd made that week would depend on how long the conversation would be because it was very, very expensive to make those calls. Unless Duck was on the exchange because he'd come in and say, three minutes, are you extending? And then he'd let us go for about three quarters of an hour. So it was letters, it was expensive phone calls, or it was wobbly old excursions in the Wolseley every second or third weekend. Florina and I love this beautiful little remote community and a couple of years ago they had the 100th anniversary of the school and so we went up there and it was fantastic. Again Florina was embraced by everybody who was up there. Her former students just wanted to hang out with her and find out what had been going on and she did the same with them. In fact one of them was now the school president. When she was teaching there, she used to love talking to me about the kids. There was only about 20 in the whole school. But there was this one kid that she particularly used to talk about. His name was Rod Matthews. And she said this kid, every lunchtime, would get out and not just run around the Oval, he'd run around the school. But not just for a minute, he'd run around the school all lunchtime. 
Now when we came into Yarpeet for this 100th anniversary, we were welcomed by the normal little welcome sign, welcome to Yarpeet, there it was. But now there's another one that stands beside it and it says this, 1999 store gift winner, Rod Matthews. And while we're on the subject of sport, I learned something very, very interesting about Florina. When it comes to sport, she is very, very competitive. A very competitive in a netball, but then I had opportunity to go up there at one time and take my camera with me and film the grudge match, the women's football grudge match between Yarpeet and a town up the road, 19Ks, called Rainbow. Keep your eyes on number seven. She's the blonde. Watch what happens. Yep, melees, hard tackles, and then of course the mark and to kick the goal that won the match for them just in the last couple of minutes as well. Yarpeet, she loved that town, and that town loved her. It was an incredibly special year in her life. It was just a wonderful, wonderful year. The kids were awesome, we had lots of fun, and um, it had a great impact on my life. And it's just been a real blessing and a real privilege to be part of this community. So at the end of 1979, Florina left Yarpeet on compassionate grounds, it was all about me, and she came back to Melbourne and was living in her house at Reservoir and had a job at Seaford Park Primary School, which was still a long way from Reservoir. So she rode, yes, this is something you may not know, she rode my 100cc green Yamaha motorbike to school, yep, all the way from Reservoir to Seaford Park. And then she had another job at Wallert, which was a little three-teacher school, and then to another school. But there was starting to develop and I'd realised a rather major problem in our relationship. The problem was, okay I'll just come straight out and say it, the problem was she still lived too far away. It wasn't Yarpeet six hours away in the Wolseley but it was still 45 minutes to get to the other side of town. And when we were school teaching, you couldn't just get in the car every night and just drive across there, spend a couple of hours and come back again because we had work to do as well. I guess one of the big advantages was that we, being back in Melbourne, we were able to have extended uh, telephone calls without Mrs. Dillon coming in every three minutes and saying, are you extending? But enough was enough. I'd had enough. I just wanted to hang out with her. I was, I was, I was, I was pathetic, actually, to be perfectly honest. And at the same time, it was becoming obvious to me that despite my shortcomings, um, my failures, my faults, that by the grace of God, he was bringing Florina and I together uh, with a purpose. And so I thought, it's time. So how do you propose to a beautiful, godly young girl that you're madly in love with? Well, my head started to swim with ideas. The first thing I thought of was maybe we could go to the cinema and I could get one of those Bell Morgan ads put up so that when it comes up, it would say, you know, Floss, will you marry me? And that would be it. But then I thought, it'll be in the dark though. I want to see her reaction. And she'll probably scream anyway. And that's probably not a really good thing to do in a public cinema. And then I thought, sky riding. Maybe I could, Floss, will you marry me? Up in the sky. That'll look pretty impressive. And then I thought, it'd be my luck. It'd be a really windy day and it'll finish up looking like a whole bunch of jumbled up smoke signals. So I went, no, nah, not that one. Now I thought, kneeling in the sunset, the ring, Nah, that just wasn't me. And then I came across something because I heard that in Melbourne they were putting up their first screen in the city square. That's where Federation Square is now, but it used to be just a big square that you could walk around. They had bands playing, all that sort of stuff too. And when I saw it, I thought, maybe I could propose on that. And so I rang the city council and said, hey, I saw your screen. Would I be able to put an ad on it? And they said, oh, we don't really do that, mate. It's, just a, it's going to be up for a couple of months. It's a bit of a test sort of thing. I said, oh, okay. He said, what did you want to do? And when I told him I was going to propose to my girlfriend, he laughed and said, hang on a sec, mate, I'll give you a phone number. So he gave me a phone number of the guy who was running the screen. 
And same thing, I said to the guy, you know, I just want to put up a 10 second ad if I can, because I know you've got things running along the bottom of the screen there. And he said, oh, we don't really do that, mate. He said, oh, what did you want? And when I told him that I just wanted to propose to my wife or to my girlfriend, he just killed himself laughing. He said, mate, I'll do that for free. And so all of a sudden I'm in this situation, I'm going, you're kidding me. First of all, I didn't even think we could get something up there, but now they're saying they're gonna do it for free. So what I did was, sorry, but I told Florina a bit of a porky pie. I told her that she was gonna be going into town to meet somebody she hadn't seen for a long, long time and to get dressed up really nicely. And I got dressed up really nicely. So we're standing on the corner of, I think it's Flinders Street and Swanson Street where the city square is there. And she's looking around, looking around to see who this person's gonna be. Of course, it's not gonna be anybody. And I'd organized that after the news, they played, the, they used to have some things up, then they'd play the news from seven to 7.30, then it would all go black. And the guy said, after it goes black, we're gonna put your little thing up. I thought, great, but I've gotta be so careful because if it runs along the bottom and she misses it, then the whole night's been wasted. So I brought my Super 8 movie camera, yes, with film in it, and I'm ready to film this thing. And she thinks I'm gonna film this happy reunion with this person she hasn't seen for years and years and years. And the next thing, this guy comes down and says, oh, are you the guy who wants the graphics? I said, yeah, I'm the guy. And Florina goes, what was that all about? And I said, I've got no idea. Anyway. The news finishes and the city square goes black and suddenly boom, the whole screen lights up. It wasn't just a thing running underneath it and I saw it and I'm looking up and I've got my camera and I'm filming it but Florina hasn't even seen it yet and so I'm shaking her and saying, oh, Florina, and she looks up and I was right, she screamed and screamed and screamed and there were cars honking and people stopping and laughing because this is like a new deal. Nobody would ever seen this before and I'd never seen it before too and, and that's why the film is so shaky. But it was up for about three minutes and it just kept on changing all the graphics which were horrible back in 1981 but they were up there and floss will you marry me and then i had to say to her well well and she's saying of course i'm going to marry you so it was just so so exciting and the whole city square just lit up with all that sort of excitement and when it was over it went off and the whole city square went black and over the loudspeaker there was this really soft congratulations and what I didn't know was the guy who got it organized had told all his mates and they'd all gone up to the bio box to see what would happen. So it was wonderful. Now we didn't have mobile phones. So we went back to my mother's house, told her what had gone on. She was really, really happy and taking photos and all that sort of stuff. Then we went across to Florina's house to tell her parents. What I didn't know was, because I never knew these things, I was meant to ask her father. Apparently that was a done thing, but I didn't do that. Not like the other three guys before me. But anyway, we did all that stuff and that was really, really wonderful. And that night, as I said goodbye to her, she said, when are we getting married? And I said, oh, we've got plenty of time for all that. And she goes, oh, okay. And I went home, slept, and I woke up the next morning and said, Floss, we gotta get married real fast. So I bought Florina an engagement ring for a whole 250 bucks. We didn't have a whole lot of money at that stage. I think the wedding rings were only like $60 or something. We booked a little church in Ringwood. We started putting our invitations together because we did this whole thing in four months because we wanted to be married so quickly. The cars, we only got cars uh, with about a week to go. The big problem was Florina's wedding dress. That was the thing we did spend a little bit of money on, but it was stuck on the docks in Sydney because there was a strike and it only just arrived two days before the wedding. The reception wasn't too swanky. We actually had it at my uncle's child minding center at the back of his house uh, with a bunch of people. I think it was $3.50 a head for a cup of tea and some biscuits. There was a, um, a chocolate cake, uh, which you wouldn't normally have back in those days. There used to be fruit cakes. We had a chocolate cake and it was half melted by the time we got there anyway, because the sun had been streaming through the window. And I remember there was also a couple of candelabras with a couple of crooked uh, pink candles in them as well. But we just wanted to be married and now we were. And we climbed into the Wolseley 2480 and we headed off uh, towards our honeymoon to start our new life together. We were just really, really thankful to God that we were now man and wife. So a little thing you may not know about my wife. Let's talk water. She would happily sit on the beach forever looking out at the beautiful ocean. She loves the ocean, she'd sit there all day. She loves glorious coastline, pounding waterfalls, majestic rivers, exploding blowholes and mirrored lakes. However, watching and appreciating the water part of creation is one thing, but getting physically involved in it 
was another. This flash, I was taking a bath. All about a Saturday night. So the ironic twist in this whole thing about Florina not liking water works like this. Her maiden name was Lake. She came from Reservoir. She married me and we lived on Waters Grove, on floodplain, next to the Dandenong Creek, across the road from the wetlands. Not bad for somebody who would never choose to be in water. Actually, there is one time I can remember where she did choose to be in water. I'd gone away on business for about three days and while I was away, she said to me, I'm going to mow the lawn. Now, she never mows the lawn. She does all the other stuff. And I said, Floss, it's OK. Uh, I'll mow the lawn when I get home. She goes, no, I'm going to mow the lawn. Well, apparently, while I was uh, heading home, she'd forgotten that she was going to do that. It is now bucketing. It is pouring, pouring, pouring. And when I come into the house, I hear this noise. And I thought, what's going on? I went through the house and looked out in the backyard. And this is what I saw. Cold and wet. I absolutely love being Florina's daughter-in-law and it's actually been a huge blessing in my life because never did I imagine that my mother-in-law would actually be one of my closest friends. Um, Florina just loved so well and so genuinely and becoming part of her family, that's literally what happened. I became one of her daughters. Florina is a wonderful mother-in-law and when I think about some of the things we've been through over the last 12 to 18 months, uh, my mind quite quickly goes back to a time when the five of us, that's my wife and our three kids, were living in a two-bedroom unit in Ringwood and uh, I don't need to tell you too much about what living with five under that roof would be like, but it was uh, a challenge. It's a bit weird, but one of the first things that comes to mind when I think of Florina is actually broccoli. Um, when I was going out with Melody um, early on in our relationship, Florina must have got wind somehow that I liked broccoli. And so no matter what dinner was, and even if it didn't seem to naturally fit, there was always this kind of side of steamed broccoli that seemed to somehow find its way into the dish. Um, <laughs> And although that's a weird story, I think what that story always reminded me of is her desire just to have you feel part of the family. I remember before I even got engaged to Samuel, coming to this house and just sitting and having a cup of tea with her for one hour, two hours, we'd just sit and talk and talk and talk. And I just knew that she just loved me. Soon after selling, we decided we would move in here with John and Florina. And so we thought it could be a couple of months while we find a house. I think it turned into about six or seven months um, and was a, a really special time. It wasn't all easy given the age and stage of where the twins in particular were at. She didn't feel like what people think in terms of a mother-in-law. Um, you just saw her as someone that loved you to bits and just saw you as, um, as much a part of her family as her own kids were a part of the family. Working full time in the city, it was, um, there was a, a lot of challenges which I, I couldn't assist with on a, a daily basis or during the day at least. And so I was very grateful for the way Florina, without asking or being asked, just was able to step in and, and help. I'd come over and she'd say, what are you having for dinner? And I'd say, oh, I think I need to go to the shops. And she'd say, no, 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 I've got a plate here, you take this, and she'd literally give me the plates of food that were for her and John for dinner. And she'd be like, oh, I don't even want that. Um, I'm happy with eggs. John loves eggs and bacon. I'll just cook that. You take this home. You feed Samuel, you feed the girls, just stretch it out. I learned a lot from Florina in just watching the way she would talk to other people, particularly in my family and my kids and, and Melody and see the way she would speak words of encouragement into their life and see the way that she would speak truth into their situation. She wasn't afraid of asking the hard questions. And sometimes I really didn't like answering the hard questions. Um, but what she was most interested in was my heart, where my heart was at, and where my heart was at in relation to God. She loved with that practical uh, sense of, of care and, and duty. Our long conversations would always end with her praying for me, for my heart where I was at, and for my relationship with God. She'd sort of point me back. She'd be my spiritual compass, refocus me. And that I'm truly going to miss. 
but it was also a huge blessing and it's taught me so much about the conversations that I have with people and how I can really be pointing people back to God. Uh, she absolutely loved our kids. I mean, it was just amazing to see her relationship with our kids, um, to see how she would just pour out over and over again for them to try and be as present as humanly possible um, in their lives. Another thing that I really cherish is this ring that Florina gave me when she was really unwell. And this ring's special because it's the ring of the Ramston girls. It's been passed down through multiple generations and she wanted me to have it as the next Ramston girl. And God willing, one day I'll be able to pass it on. A passion for loving others, but knowing that God loved them even more. And a woman of great truth. Quick to jump in and help. Never complain. Servant heart. That she would embrace any and everyone who came into her path. She was a woman of great wisdom. Yeah, never know anyone else quite like her. I don't actually remember the first time that I specifically met Florina because I used to come into church and then like bolt, you know, run, didn't want to talk to anyone, didn't want to, you know, get to know anyone. Um, but it's pretty funny how God works because obviously I had Willow and then would bring her to creche and Florina would just be so kind and beautiful and, and chat to me. And, and I actually believe that God really used a really difficult time in our lives massively um, to use Florina when we had no one else to deeply serve us as a family. Um, I remember the night that she stayed in emergency ward with me all night when my mum was really sick and, and then also stopped at our house when we needed someone to stay there all night. It, it, it was just crazy, really. And at the time, I had no idea what was going on, obviously, very spiritually blind. Um, but Jesus has opened my eyes to how he used her so beautifully just uh, to show us his love and, and that he was there and that he cared. And I know that uh, in this church, she has been like that for so many people. I know that um, she has just made so many people feel like they belong. I think it's really easy as Christians to uh, make a meal for someone and to run and drop it. But she would really open her heart and her life to people. And I think that was so significant, uh, the way that God used her and that she just loved the word of God. Uh, she, she would message me all the time, uh, verses, praying for you. And I, I just knew that she was the woman I'd go to if I, I needed God. I needed prayers, basically. Um, I knew she would pray. I knew she would genuinely pray. I knew she would check in on me um, to see if God had answered that prayer. Uh, she was just a beautiful, beautiful woman who I will so dearly miss. And um, one verse that she wrote in a book for me when I got baptised, which is on my bedroom wall and it's just speaking truth to me all the time, is um, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Had a lot of uh, practice carrying you too. Oh. <laughs> That's you. How do you think these got so big? <laughs> Literally the way that she lived and the way that she parented yeah. just came out of like biblical love. Well, that's come out of, I think, mum and dad each yeah. having genuine relationships with God. Well, I think well, we've been extremely blessed to grow up in a home where mum and dad have definitely not had Jesus as a Sunday person. It has just been so ingrained in our whole lives. It was just part of everything, wasn't it? Yeah, there were so many times when it was just like simple things, like we couldn't find the TV remote. And she's like, we should pray about this. But you look back now and you go, she was just instilling into us that yeah. conversation with God is just the way that it should be. You want to say thank you to God? You want to say thank you to God for the milkshake? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for the milkshake. Amen. Um, Good girl. Do you remember the day when we went fishing and mum had prayed that we would catch a fish mm. and we all caught these salmon and we were so excited and we brought them home and we gave away a few of them. We kept dad's because it was the biggest and mum cooked it up and put lemon inside it and we tasted it and it was it's disgusting. So <laughs> and this fish that we were so excited about, I reckon most of it ended up in the bin. When dad started at Mary Kay and we had a pink dinner where she turned everything oh, Even the rice was pink. And one of my favourite dinners, I told her about years later, I was like, remember that dinner where we had a million tiny courses? She's like, Kobe, I was using up everything in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, really good memories I have of being picked up from um, the School of Excellence in the city yeah. mm -hmm. and mum always having a hot plate of dinner in the car that I could eat on the drive home. It was just the best and it was always so good. I just eat my dinner on the way home and talk to her and but that was her, wasn't it? She would yeah. drive us everywhere and everywhere. anywhere. What she loved about driving us everywhere is it's like you, she just had us in the car. Yeah. Captive audience. <laughs> and she could talk to us about anything. One of my big memories is because I'd catch the bus to and from Dunvale and then she'd pick me up at the Manhattan. And every single day when I'd get there, she'd be fast asleep. <laughs> and I, re I remember the one day I snuck up to the car and started banging on the window and yelling and she screamed so loud. She hit me when I got in the car. Meals here with the family and how often, you'd never notice because she'd always be in the kitchen, she'd always be, she'd set out all the plates and give everyone their food and everyone would be eating and all of a sudden you'd realise either mum has this much on her plate or she's not eating at all because there wasn't enough food and she wanted everyone to have she wanted everyone else to make sure that they'd eaten well before she time. ate mm. anything. Yeah. Another thing that was always really such a blessing about mum was how opening she was with our house yes. and how like you never felt bad about asking if a friend could come over mm. and like even at the end um, getting messages from people that I haven't heard from in years just saying that they always just remember how welcoming mum was and yeah. how she was always happy to have us and how the only time that they ever saw her angry is when she was telling me off for doing something <laughs> stupid but it was just, Samuel. it was so good. <laughs> Samuel! <laughs> you knew that people would come in and they'd be like, this place is happy, this place is fun. I think um, when I became a mum, the greatest realisation I had about our mum on holidays was how much work she was actually doing Do to it, make mm. my holiday fun. <laughs> I, think I, realized, that. I think I realised when I grew up how much, like my holidays as a kid were awesome, but how much mum was actually sacrificing behind the scenes to do that. Because I remember thinking, I've actually got to work on my holidays. Like I've got to do stuff to make fun. And then I realised that all the stuff that That's mum had been doing, doing behind the scenes. I just remember being in the car with mum on a lot of holidays when dad was driving and her just freaking out about the way that he drove. <laughs> she liked him to drive with purpose. She yes. Drive with purpose. <laughs> Had to be doing like 80 in the 110 zone. And I know, you'd always see her hand, you're turning left. <laughs> Mum had memorised every McDonald's <laughs> from, from Melbourne right through to the Gold Coast. So we'd be driving and she'd be like, we should stop soon. This McDonald's is coming up. I can remember the first time at a McDonald's where I finished my whole cheeseburger, it was actually a junior burger at the time, where I finished the whole burger and she looked at me and she's like, where's it gone? Where's it gone? I was like, I ate it. And she's like, no! Because <laughs> she would always just eat my leftover bits and she was so sad because she's like, no, I'm going to have to start buying my own food. Your own. You know, in every way, she modelled a life that was putting God first, but above everything. And I think she wasn't afraid to sacrifice her time, her sleep. Mm. Um, particularly when she was doing a lot of work in BSF in the early days. Yeah. I don't think I appreciated how much time that took and how inadequate she felt, but she was just so faithful to and dependent on God in all things. You know, I'll call her with maybe it's something to the kids, I don't know what's going on, or could have been early in uni days or whatever. And she will always pray before you mm. get off the phone. Like, no matter what, yeah. she will always pray. And it would often start, Dear loving Lord Jesus. Mm. Yeah, like, always. That was just so often the start of her prayers, Dear loving Lord Jesus. It's funny because I do that as well. And Holly, the other day for the first time, was oh. praying and she said, Dear loving Lord Jesus. And I was like, Oh, oh there it so is. Cool. That was so real fun. Cool. I can remember a specific conversation that you and me and mum, when I was 14, so you must have been 16. Mm in in mum and dad's bedroom and it was about um boyfriends and whatever and she was saying i really wish i hadn't done this i really wish i hadn't done that please learn from my mistakes mm. and part of that conversation she said to us she said please know that one day when you have boyfriends or whatever she said if if your dad and i are ever concerned that this is you know that there are red flags in this relationship or this person is not for you there will be a lot of prayer that goes into it before we bring anything to you mm -hmm. with our concerns. Mm -hmm. So know that if we bring, we're bring we bringing concern to you, 
it is not done lightly or flippantly. Mm. It's done with a lot of prayer. And I can remember after I'd been with Jimmy for maybe a few months, mum just said to me, she actually made a comment. She said, I just want you to know I have no concerns here. And it was actually really nice because that mm. meant so much more based on a conversation I had when I was 14. I loved how mum was always really quick to ask for forgiveness as well. Oh. The amount of time she'd say something or do so, oh, sorry, oh. God. <laughs> <laughs> But it was just, it was a sign of how much she was in his word and walking with him that she was so aware if yeah. she did something that she felt was outside of what God wanted for her, yeah. it was on her heart straight away. Yeah. It wasn't something that she would do lots of things and then later on be like, oh, maybe it was just an instant. Oh. I have to say one of the biggest childhood memories is the CD, Hymns and Voices, <laughs> blasting through the house. On that big black boombox thing. Any hour of the day. I think we know all those words off by heart. She absolutely loved it. There were some not so biblical songs as well. I remember often mum singing one boy, boy for sale. He's going cheap. <laughs> I have... Just such beautiful memories of standing with her in church with her. Mm. She would always sing a blessing over us yeah. each night before we went to sleep from mm. number six. And dad would do that too. Yeah. Um, lots of little songs as well, like Trust and Obey. Mm. Um, holy, holy, one. holy. Jesus loves me. And she yeah. sang that with our kids and stuff as well. Oh, yeah. Like, I always remember her singing Great is Thy Faithfulness. That's yeah. That one, yeah.
both mum and dad let God do the work. Mm. Yeah. But also we're never afraid to speak truth in love. Mum was never backwards mm. in coming forwards. Ooh, we always yeah. knew what she thought, but it was timely, it was prayed through. And oh, actually, you know, she would just speak her heart. And I, I think back now to how much mum kept us strong and kept us pointed at God through some really tough times. Yeah. Like with dad being dad and having heart attacks and strokes and MS and yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. all kinds of random things. How, <laughs> how even when dad was really, really, really sick, there was never a lack of hope and a lack of joy. Oh. And the way that mum just held everything together in those times when dad couldn't be there. Mm. And the way that like, because often dad was the more fun one because he'd come home and do something fun. Mum would, mum was always fun, but I felt like she stepped up that to kind of cover while dad couldn't be there as well. Yeah. She was just so sensitive to us. And I look like, when I think about everything that happened in those years and how much I don't have horrible memories of that time yeah. and how yeah. much it just felt like, oh, that was just part of our life and life just continued. And mum just, she really looked after us in that space unbelievably and i think it just stems from the fact that she's so self-sacrificing yeah. she would do everything for us first and do you remember when dad was really sick and we got given um so many like so much food but so many tuna casseroles and it got oh. to a point where we just i was like i can't eat another tuna casserole. and i remember one day mum opening the freezer and like put your tuna casserole, I think I started crying. <laughs> and so she put it back in and we got pizza. <laughs> that was such a happy house. Such a happy house. Where are we? Home. Where's home? Um, the other thing I was thinking of was I had this memory of mum sitting on the chair by the phone over there talking to countless nieces, mm. nephews, or, or um, just people from church or and her counselling people over the phone. I just she modelled to us so early what it is to care for people mm. in that way. Absolutely. Um, and just the way she threw her whole life into caring for families and kids. And I even was thinking about the fact how at church or wherever we went, actually, we could go anywhere. We were always the last people to leave. <laughs> and why was that? Because, <laughs> like, always, anywhere, anything. Because both mum mom and, and dad are there sewing into people's lives and just listening to them, asking them the questions that would make them just spill out their whole life story because they genuinely cared. Speaking of being last to leave at church, I remember the time that her and dad both thought that the other person had me. <laughs> And they left me at church all by myself. Well, not by myself. I was with Samuel Grace. It was the best thing ever. We each got left once. I got left once. Trevor Bell looked after me. <laughs> I so can't. Okay. <laughs> Mum also taught us to pray over a long period of time for something. And the memory that I have is of some family friends of ours who couldn't have a baby. Mm. And every night, four years, mm. we prayed for this family to be able to have a baby. And I think I was still really young when they finally did have a baby and she was born but that just marks such a faith building mm. experience for me to see prayers prayed over many years actually answered and I remember going into that hospital yeah. and I'll never forget when we were there and 
Emily was there in that crib. Yeah. I just never forget it. And to see the fulfillment of all those prayers that we prayed when we were young. We were mm. young when we, we were praying. We were young. Little. And I remember mum saying, it's a miracle. She's it a is. miracle, baby. Mm. Yeah. And I'll never forget mm. that. To see that God answers prayers, but it's not necessarily an immediate thing. Mm. It can be many, 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 many years of praying. And she always taught us to trust him regardless of what the outcome was. Mm. Um, and the amazing thing was, for me, is how it Emily then actually got to be mm. my flower girl when I yeah. got married. That was amazing to see that full circle of what God had done. Um, and that's a really significant moment for me in my own Christian life and walk. Mm. And for me as well with mum, like I look at the way that she guided me over my life and the way that she gradually tapered off how much she would push me and how much mm. she would poke me. Mm. And when I was young, she would give me lots of instruction. And then as I got older, and I remember even this year, um, her going to say things and going, I actually don't need to tell you this anymore. Mm. I don't need to tell you. And it was just that time of like, I can see that so many of the things that she did tell me when I was little are now instilled in who I am. Mm. And she actually doesn't need to say it because I know it. And now it's just a simple one word will remind me of the truth that she instilled in me a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how old I would have been. We were still in Seven Oaks Avenue, but I was getting, I was, wouldn't have been that old, but probably a little bit older, and I'd done something horrendous. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> it was worthy of a really good smack. It was something. Oh, I can't well, remember. they didn't come lightly. They no, were, they didn't. You to be really, yeah, it was very How would you know? You never got smacked. I well, that's true. Oh, okay. I did one. You were the I most. I, I was second. <laughs> I, I, might have, I thought I might have had a couple, and mum said to me, no, I, you only ever had it once. I'm like, probably the threat was hanging over my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually wouldn't have had many either, but I'll never forget that mum took me up to my room. I knew that I was deserving of this, and I'll never forget it. She hit as hard as she could, but she actually, I didn't realise she put her hand, it's going to make me cry saying it, she put her hand in front of that, wooden spoon and it actually made a really significant mark she'd hit herself really really hard and she said to me melody that's what jesus did for you mm. he took the punishment for you that's exactly what he's done and and that was the last time that wooden mm. spoon never came out again for me but that stayed with me it was so powerful to me in terms of seeing that visually knowing that i was so deserving there was no question mm. of that but she showed me you know that's exactly what jesus did he stood there. he took that punishment for you mm. i'm like mm. so powerful i still remember my last smack really well as well because <laughs> <laughs> i was a lot older and <laughs> i'd done so something <laughs> I'd done something and she said to me, you can choose. You can either not watch Pokemon or you can, or you can have a smack. And I said to her, I'll take the smack. <laughs> Which she later told me, I called her bluff because she didn't want to smack me. So she was like, I know an easy way to get out of this. I'll just say you can not watch your TV show. Little did she know, you don't watch Pokemon. You're socially isolated for the next few weeks at school. So... Yeah, she, she always told me that I oh, really regretted that. <laughs> it was like her aim in life to become a grandmother. I think was it at your wedding or I don't know if she's yeah. at your wedding. I don't know. She was always telling us essentially it's like, when are you going to make me a grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> Which she was always like kind of a joke, but also really like not really a joke. She really wanted to be a grandmother. I know. She's already trying to look around. I reckon she already knows my voice. Oh dear. <laughs> she started already.
If I'd known how good it was to have grandkids, I would have had them first. <laughs> If I thought that she loved us, oh. um, <laughs> she loved our children so, so, much. so much. I I often felt that mum knew my kids better than me. And oh. maybe because I was in the throes of dealing with them, where she was standing back and having that chance to observe them, I just felt she knew so much about every single one of their little personalities. Totally. Every gift that she gave them was handpicked just for them because she knew what mm. they liked or what they didn't like. Yeah. I'd often be like, oh, what about this or this or this? She'd be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the gift that she gave would actually be the one that they loved so yeah. much because she knew them. So true. Um, I almost got jealous for a while because legitimately, Amali loved mum more than me for quite a stretch of time there. <laughs> I think when I'd had the twins and... Mum was spending so much time because I needed so much help. So she was helping me with Amali and the twins. And Amali just clung to mum mm. and loved her so, so, so much. Who do you love the most? Nini. Why do you love Nini the most? They're just two. Fair enough. I legitimately was second for quite a while there. She loved our kids so much and she sacrificed for them so much mm. in in her prayer for them. I oh, love just yeah. being able to talk about them with her and and she always was able to hear me out because she knew them too. Um, I would not have made it through those first 19 months with the, my girls at that one. No. Um, and I even think about when, when we came here to tell... Um, to tell mum, she was the only one home at the time, dad was, dad was at work, to tell her we just had our ultrasound to find out we were having twins. And she was looking after Amali for us here. And she, yeah, her reaction was priceless. <laughs> Scream. Heartbreak. Do you want to see? Yes! I'm thinking. just like I always wanted twins mm. I always wanted twins and um yeah she got to experience twins pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> she pretty, lived it. pretty full on at least <laughs> the start my favorite thing that I miss so much is um I used to just occasionally just out of nowhere hear our gate click and she'd just appear <laughs> through the windows unannounced and it was always the best yeah. like I just miss that I I think I found myself lately hearing that gate click and just have for a split second, like, oh, maybe that's, maybe that, you know, just for mm. a split second. And it's like, oh, no, it's not going to be her. But that was the best. And yeah. Sometimes she would just drop in and it would just be at the right time when you needed some company or you needed somebody to help. If mum hadn't been thinking about my dinners, my whole family would have starved. If <laughs> she'd be calling me going, Clovey, what are you planning for dinner? Like, oh, I don't know, you tell me what to do. I know she often said to James, I'm so sorry, I she failed did. you. <laughs> We had the last time at the hospital with her and she just kind of came awake and she's like, yeah. okay, someone needs to go and get something from the cafe. Like, so I've got yeah. something to give them when they come. <laughs> what did you say to Nina? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Nina. That day had been quite a bad day. Yeah. And I was, as soon as the grandkids were around, just she was just alive. totally... It was hard as well at the hospital because mainly we were having a baby and tell them mum and whew, getting a chance to kind of tell mum the names that we've got and not tell dad we locked him in the <laughs> toilet so that he couldn't hear but we got to share them with mum and I told her that our girl's name was going to be Florina and she said don't you dare <laughs> Um, but it, it's just, it was one of those times of, she just wanted to be, she knew she wasn't going to be able to be there when the, when our baby's born, but she wanted to be as much a part of its life as she possibly could. And just having her with her hand on Liv's tummy, just knowing 
the name of this child, if it's a boy or if it's a girl. Mum and Dad were inseparable. I can't see yeah. one without the other. I found that really hard, actually, because I just, they were together. You yeah. guys, they didn't lead separate lives. It didn't feel like that. It felt like they're such a unified front, always. Except for that one time <laughs> <laughs> that I asked Mum for a puppy and she said no. <laughs> so I took Dad back to the same pet shop. And me, and I and said, <laughs> and we came home with a puppy and it was dad that got in trouble not me <laughs> our childhood was full of surprises and mum yes. and dad were behind that and mum was always willing to go along with that's their right. yeah. dad would ideas. have crazy ideas but mum would go along with it which almost makes her the crazier one like you know, she's just willing to go with dad's ideas crazy is probably an understatement for a lot of dad's ideas <laughs> but mum and dad were also each other's best friends like they had other friends around them but they just really actually just really loved each other. <laughs> and they told us that. We were in such a secure oh, totally. environment. We knew how loved we were. Yeah. They told us how loved we were all the time. Her generosity, her love, she lavished her love. She was a gift giver totally. and she was a servant. Yeah. To my beautiful grandchildren, Caleb, Zachary, Amali, Holly, Sierra, Ayla, Aubrey, and surprise baby number three for Ramsden family. Let's pray now. Okay. Dear God, can you please do something really amazing for Nene and take the virus away? Amen. Amen. Now, I know you've all been praying for me to get well. And you know what? God's chosen the best answer. He's made me really well to be able to live with him. So thank you for praying for me. He knows every part of you. So always talk to him. You know, you can pray to him, talk to him, whatever you like. He's always with you. And even when you've got to do hard things, God is with you. You're never alone. You're never alone. What a joy that is. Dear loving Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all my grandchildren. Thank you for Caleb, for Zaki, for Amali, for Holly, for Sierra, for Ayla, for Aubrey, and baby number three for Ramsden. Lord, I just pray that you would hold on to them, that you would encourage them, comfort them, teach them, and grow them in your ways. I love them. And I thank you for the love that you've placed in my heart for each one of them. And I thank you, Lord God, that you love them even more. Amen. When it came to things like anniversaries and birthdays for Florina and I, we we're very, very much on the same page. We'd rather just hang out together. In fact, I remember the only time that we ever went out for an anniversary, we went out to a, a Mexican restaurant in Ringwood somewhere, and we sat there, and we'd been there for about five minutes, and we looked at each other, and Floss said, you wanna go home and play with the kids? I went, yeah, let's go play with the kids. So we went home and played with the kids. So we weren't really, you know, we weren't presenty people, we weren't go out for anniversary type people, which is great for, for people who like that sort of stuff, but we just liked hanging out. But what she did like was surprises, particularly if they were meaningful surprises. Now the house where I am standing in front of right here, this is where we lived in uh, Donvale for quite a few years. And so I thought for a surprise for Florina's birthday, when she was probably around 34 years old, I might write her a song. So what I did was, I told her that I had to go out on business for the next three nights. And so what I'd do is, I would come out of the driveway and I'd drive about 100 metres up the road here. Then I'd park the car and then I would walk to Manny's house, who's the guy I was recording with. He had this tiny little studio in his house. It was reel to reel. And so I'd go into Manny's house and we did this three nights in a row until we'd done it. Hey, Manny! There you go, mate. Good to see you. Good to see you. And so we did this over these three nights and then I presented it to Florina. You ready for this? on cassette, for those who can remember cassettes, and she actually loved it. Now I look back on it, it's a little bit daggy, but the words were from the heart. And interestingly enough, I've had to listen to it again just recently, and I can see now uh, that the words are even more meaningful than they were uh, considering the circumstances. So that was just one of those special things that uh, Florina loved, getting something, a little bit of a surprise that meant something. Couldn't tell what 
Lorena loved patterns and she actually knitted me this vest back in 1979 while she was still teaching up at Yard Pete and I wore it everywhere. For years and years and years I wore it everywhere. But she didn't just love patterns in clothing. Number patterns were incredibly important to her. She just loved, loved seeing numbers in some sort of sequence. And if somebody's anniversary or somebody's birthday lined up with these numbers, she would let them know. She'd see that way before anybody else saw that. And today's a very significant time too because we have... Um, a friend of ours who we've known for around 16 years and this friend has been very very faithful to us and there's a significant number today and I thought well, I really needed to recognize that today and that is our little Toyota Echo over here just before Florina died it had nearly rolled up 300,000 and today was the day that our little friend finally got to 300,000 and so I thought it was fitting that we have a celebration so I brought some flowers and I thought that we should say congratulations to our Echo Yep, she loved patterns. They say opposites attract. So how did Florina and I go when it came to that? Well, she was chalk and I was cheese. She barracked for the Collingwood Football Club. I barracked for the Melbourne Football Club. Her blood type was B negative. Mine was A positive. She paid attention to detail and me, not so much. She didn't forget anything. I forgot everything. I messed up dates. I forgot when I was meant to be places. I got messed up all the time, but she loved me so much, did that actually bother her? Sometimes. 
This is Melody Hill. Is she now for us? Four months and... Oh, put the date on it, can you? Um, it's April the 2nd. 3rd. 3rd. Is it April the 3rd? How old is Kobe today, Foss? Are you four weeks? Yep. Of April 1994. 1994. And today was the first time days. she smiled. 19, 19, 19 days. days old. Pink balloons. But a very lovely one. Thank you, darling. You've got the pink cake that they oh, pink cake. in there at a mate. We've actually been up at Belgrave Heights, haven't we, Floss? And we've been looking after about 99 kids. No, it was just over 100. Oh, it was just over 100 kids. Here we have Samuel at how many weeks old? Three weeks old. Three weeks and two days. Three weeks and two days old. Quick, quick, quick. We've got to go. Don't stand on her dress, though. Let's push it and throw it forwards. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you Malia? I'm no. not John. <laughs> oh, Malia. No, I'm Malia. I'm Malia. <laughs> Dad, you need to get into your mum. To be standing there. That's, that's funny. I'm Marley. It's what not funny. Saying, what it's saying, actually you know not what funny. It, is, it's, 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 got, it's going to happen and we knew it's no. like it's not a normal day. Nini. Come on, just say it properly. It properly. Go! Go! Run! 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 Well, think of Mali, the Mali, the country is essentially the, the you know, Mali. Is there a country called Mali? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that again. Yes. Whole country named after her. <laughs> Okay, so I might have messed up a few times, but at least when it came to present buying, I knew exactly what she liked. <laughs> Hey, my beautiful grandchildren. I know that you miss Nini, because I really, really miss her too. I miss the sound of her singing voice around the house. I miss watching her playing with little kids. She loved, loved children. I miss her wisdom in counselling that we used to do with young people as they were getting ready to get married. Her wisdom was amazing. In fact, sometimes that wisdom would often kick me under the table in case I was about to say something that I shouldn't, or it would kick me because I just said something that I shouldn't. I'm going to miss praying with her and reading before we go to bed at night. And I'm going to miss sometimes we would turn the light off uh, after that and, and we would just dance in the dark. We didn't need any music, we didn't need any light, we just loved doing that. And then talking with her uh, deep into the night as we lay in each other's arms. And then I loved listening carefully as I heard her breathing change and I knew she was asleep. And then I miss her waking up in the morning sometimes, just randomly telling me the birthday of some random person that she met at some stage and she still remembers their birthday. I don't know how she did that. She was amazing with that sort of stuff. I'm gonna miss seeing the light under the walk-in robes at about three o'clock and four o'clock in the morning sometimes when I knew she was in there praying for somebody or for some situation. I'm gonna really miss hearing multiple times a day her tell me that she loves me. I'm gonna miss her eyes. I'm going to miss her laugh that I could pick in a room of a thousand people. And I'm really going to miss her smile. Really miss her smile.
Being married to Florina was amazing. God had blessed us with three beautiful kids and we just loved the life that he'd given us. In amongst all that, of course, was the fact that I had a stroke and I had three heart attacks and a whole bunch of unexplained medical issues that occurred after a baseball incident back in 1981, which was the same year we also got married. And that year and those years after that, I was going from specialist to specialist, from hospital to hospital. So you get a bit of a picture of what Florina was dealing with as a wife and a new mum trying to bring up kids as well. But during that time, she was amazing. She nursed me, she encouraged me, she prayed for me, and she loved me with everything that she had. Things eventually did settle, and over the course of time, our three children married beautiful, godly partners, just adding to our joy as parents. Melody married Paul, and so she became a Lewis, and then Kobe married James and became a Docking, and then Samuel married Liv to keep that Ramsden name alive. Also in the course of time, along came one by one by one by one by two by one grandkids and they all started to show up. Sadly, we lost a little grandchild, Lily, uh, who we held just for such a short time, but uh, we still love and remember her. In fact, now every year the kids get me a traditional t-shirt, which has got all of the grandchildren on it. And every single year now, we still have Caleb, who's Lily's oldest brother. He always is holding a Lily just to remind us of her and to keep her in our heart. She'll always be dear uh, to this family. Oh, that's fantastic. That is fantastic. And, and Caleb's got Lily. He has. Oh, I know. During the last few years of our marriage, I don't know if Florina and I could have ever imagined uh, the amount of joy that we had as not only God grew our own marriage, but also we watched our own kids uh, starting to train up their own little tribes as well. But what we didn't know that was lurking in the shadows of all this joy was something that was about to rear its ugly head in Florina's body. Up to this point in our marriage, it had always been Florina that was looking after me. I was always the one that was sick, but our roles were about to be reversed. Trim.
It started out really with a really sore leg and a sore back, and that turned into an agonizing pain in both of those areas. And then that led to hospital visits and tests and scans and everything, and that eventually led to a diagnosis of a thing called blastoid mantle cell lymphoma, which is the worst of the lymphomas you can get hold of, and they don't really have a cure for that. The day I took Florina into the hospital, she wrote two verses of scripture on the mirror in our bathroom. And these were verses that we had chosen to hold on to during this journey we're about to head into. And they're out of Psalm 33, verses 20 to 22. And it says, We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. So she wrote the verses up on the mirror. We prayed together and we got in the car and headed off to the hospital. What we weren't expecting was the little cheer squad that greeted us as we came out of the driveway. Yay, Watched two things begin simultaneously the first day that she came to that hospital. The first thing was the treatment, which was harsh and severe. In fact, one of the specialists, the guy who was running the stem cell thing, he actually told us that in years to come, they're going to say that this sort of treatment is barbaric. And that's what it was. It was basically kill everything to try and save the person, which sounds crazy, but uh, it was necessary uh, to try and do anything for her at that stage. The second thing was the relationships that she built the moment that she set foot uh, in that building, particularly with the young nurses. Uh, she took an interest in their lives straight away. She asked them about their lives too. And I remember very, very clearly, very clearly, uh, stepping into the room one day and stepping straight back out because she had her hands out like this and she had the head of one of the young nurses cupped in her hands. And she was saying to her, but does he love you? What you're saying to me does not show that he loves you. And so she just uh, was able to do these types of things, even at this time. She determined from the word go that she was going to love God and love people no matter where she was. She was in so much pain, so, so sick. But there were times where she was able to come home for a period of time, which was great. Uh, just to have her in the house again was wonderful. But we had been warned about the character and the unpredictability of this particular disease. And uh, I remember very, very clearly, particularly in those last uh, couple of months that we even before we got to the scans, Florina and I had sorted out the fact that uh, this thing was back again. So it was no surprise to us uh, when the scans came back and they weren't good. I remember one particular night in our house where the family was around and all the kids were playing and people were talking and chatting. And Florina looked across at me from the other side of the room and she smiled. And it must be like because we've been married for so long or something. But I knew in that smile she was actually telling me that she was dying. And when we went to bed that night and I asked her, she said, that was exactly what I was telling you at that time. And a couple of days later, she collapsed in my arms here at home and um, was ambulanced back to the hospital where she'd spent her last days. The nurses in the oncology ward were incredibly kind and they set up a bed beside her so that I could sleep there at night with her, read with her, pray with her, uh, nurse her when she needed nursing. At that time, it was really tough for her because only her right arm was working. But even in these last days, as people came, she would come alive and she would be speaking to them and caring for them as well. It's really interesting. Her sisters came in, which was great that they were able to see her for a last time. And uh, our kids were able to come in and see her during the day. And then, most incredibly, the grandchildren were able to come in and see her for the last time. Her precious, precious grandchildren. What a moment that was. <laughs> Love doing what he asks you to do and living for him. Yeah. That's fine, isn't it? Hey, Mimi, my daddy, you 
birthday by the reason of my birthday. Then finally, in the early hours of June 24th, which was also her granddaughter Amalie's fourth birthday, she was called home from this life to be with the Lord. No more pain, no more suffering, but now pure joy in the presence of her Lord. She was, as God's word tells us, absent from the body and present with the Lord. Melody was with me when Florina died, and not long after that, Samuel and Kobe came into the hospital and we spent some time uh, with her crying and beginning to grieve over their mother and my precious wife, who I had had the blessing and privilege of being with for nearly 39 years. There was also time in the next couple of days to begin to um, give thanks for her. And I just felt the need to take her for one last walk before laying her to rest. And it shall change our mortal body, that it may be like his glorious body. Thanks be to God, who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Is there anything that you would say to her? <sighs> I'm very, very sorry that you couldn't come to my birthday. I'm very, very sorry. I'm just missing you. Mum, it's missing you too. Mum has been crying all, all day because you have died, Nini. You know, if somebody ever said to me, what's the greatest thing that's ever happened in your life? Well, that'd be easy, because that would be the saving love of God that made me his child, and there's nothing more wonderful than that. But I'd also tell him something else great happened to me as well. And that was the day that as a young man, I met a young woman who was wearing a pair of pink overalls. Working you and through you to bring about his purposes for his world.